You're listening to You First, the Disability Rights Florida podcast. On this episode, we celebrate the life and accomplishments of Judy Human. Thanks for listening. I'm Keith. And I'm Maddie. And on today's show, we're going to take some time to talk about the life and legacy of J.D. Human. So for folks who may or may not know, on March 4th, 2023, the world was pretty much shocked by the passing of the legendary disability rights activist and leader Judith, or more commonly you know, referred to as Judy Human. She's considered the mother of the disability rights movement and frankly is a badass. She was essential to the disability rights movement, disability rights advocacy and progress. And it's really because of her advocacy that organizations like ours can even do the work that we can do today. So we really are indebted to her and her work and her advocacy. And we'll definitely continue her fight for disability rights after she's moved on in her honor. So to honor her, we kind of wanted to do a special tribute talking about who she was, her advocacy, her accomplishments, and frankly, just her long-lasting impact, her presence that she'll forever have on the disability community and the world. Yeah. So let's kind of kick in just a little bit who she was, her background. So her family's actually originally from Germany, and the family is Jewish, and this is happening during the 30s and 40s during the Nazi regime. So in 1935, Judy's family came to the U.S., eventually settled in Philadelphia, and Judy was born in 1947. A number of her family were murdered in the Holocaust, and so that sort of adds perspective to who she was. She really grew up in Brooklyn, uh, and at 18 months of age, she contracted polio, which was another, you know, huge thing happening in the 40s. And Because of that, she used a wheelchair for the majority of her life. So even as a young child, she was in the fight. She had to struggle and and fight for her rights. First of all, her family had to fight just to get her included in school, just to get her into school. Because believe it or not, local school officials there, they considered her a fire hazard. What, What an inhumane thing to say about somebody. I know. I mean, a human being is not a fire hazard. It just... Well, ultimately, she received home instruction uh, a couple times a week for an hour, which seems not quite enough, but that's what they were given. Yeah, bare minimum. But her mom was an advocate and and helped fight to get Judy into school. So uh, she comes from a family of of advocates. Still, it was a struggle. It was a challenge to maintain access to schools. Back then, 40s and 50s, there was no legal mandate demanding, you know, any kind of inclusion or accessibility in the education space. Always yeah. a struggle. Right. Yeah. And some historical like context and things from her book noted that even though she finally got access in middle school and things like that, she still struggled throughout high school, college, which we're going to eventually touch on. But around this yeah. time in her life is when she started attending this camp, this camp for other people with disabilities called Camp Jenid. And for those listening, you might be familiar with this. This is the camp that's featured in the now very famous Oscar-nominated film Crip Camp that documents kind of the origins of the disability rights movement starting with that community attending Camp Jenid. And one quote comes up when folks talk about Camp Jenid is, We had the same joy together, the same anger over the way we were treated, and the same frustrations and opportunities we didn't have. So it really was this really important space when thinking about the origins of disability organizing, the disability rights movement, because it was really in these community spaces that people with disabilities who have, you know, experienced barriers like Judy in education or healthcare or even the ability to navigate the area where they live. It was this space where everybody was given their access needs. They were given to participate in the camp and that community. So it really was this place that barriers and ableism like fell away and that people could have the access that they just needed 
and it was normalized compared to what they experienced in that non-camp space. Um, Sad that at that time a camp was needed for to to feel that way. Yeah, you know? you know, and it's really interesting because as someone with a disability, I have a form of muscular dystrophy and grew up going to a camp for kids with muscular dystrophy and other related conditions. And I went starting in early middle school when I was just like a preteen. But at that time, I still, that was the first time I had ever experienced like what full inclusion and access was supposed to be like and what it felt like and how to be and the ability to be around people who had similar bodies mm -hmm. and ways of moving and different needs. So it really was and was such an impactful space for me to be a part of, but it just goes to show how impactful these spaces are for people with disabilities and their ability to like build community and establish a sense of self and community, just like Camp Jenid. So this is a really cool aspect of disability history. So I definitely recommend checking out Crip Camp and some of the history around this. Oh yeah, it's a fabulous film. If you have not seen it, you definitely need to, to check that out for sure. Well, she graduated from Long Island University in 1969 and uh, had planned to be a teacher. So in 1970, she passed any exams that she needed to, to be a teacher. Um, but apparently, it's news to me, You, at least then you had to have a physical exam to be a teacher. Yeah, I was uh, reading into it and I guess... The reasoning of this, what ended up being this court case was that she wouldn't be able to get children that she was teaching, whatever age that she was teaching, like out of a building during a fire because she herself would maybe experience barriers getting out of a building, which is a whole other conversation. But but right. if I was mind blown because you don't need to be non-disabled to teach. It's like a... <laughs> Anyways, no, no. It's just it, all it, very... It's, right wrong reasoning but it, it's really fascinating uh well so she was denied that and, and you you mentioned a case so that so yes she sued the city of new york the board of education for the city of new york specifically and that it, that case got some press in fact there was a headline in one newspaper uh, referring to franklin delano roosevelt having been president you can be president not teacher with polio uh so it was an interesting perspective and uh it like I say it got some press and the case was ultimately settled and Judy Human became the first wheelchair using teacher in New York City. So yeah, like this is we're seeing this life of advocacy and struggle and fighting for what you need. Yeah, definitely and it's because of this court case that a lot of people with disabilities around the country started following her. They were sending yeah. her mail, sending her just like letters of appreciation and in like acknowledgement of her fight to bring more access and equity for people with disabilities. And because of this, like she kind of realized the need for more of this work. And obviously being a lifelong advocate already at this point in her life was starting to, like you said, start down this path. She and several of her friends created an organization called Disabled in Action, which was all about really getting out and doing political protests to start demanding more civil rights for people with disabilities, because it's really important to know at this point in the 70s, early 70s, people with disabilities really didn't have <laughs> many rights if at all. People were, and still, but were living in institutions in really bad situations. So at this point, there, there really were no laws. There were yeah, there exactly. was no, yeah, no to mandate anything. Exactly. So this is where kind of Judy saw the future of her life and advocacy take off. One of the more famous protests from this organization called Disabled in Action, one of the many things that she ends up being a part of in her life, included the famous traffic stopping protest in New York City on Madison Avenue, where over 80 activists with disabilities blocked that area of the road in a, in protest of President Nixon vetoing early versions of the Rehabilitation Act, which would have been a pretty important law kind of starting yeah, the move for, sure. for disability rights and disability rights access. So we'll definitely link to some of that coverage and some photos from that. But that was a really important thing. And that was one of the first of its kind of this major politicized disabled advocacy or activist event and really getting out in the public 
and showing like we are here, we're disabled, and we're mm-hmm. going to do everything we can to really demand our civil rights, which is exactly what they continue to do. Yeah. Yeah. Groundbreaking at the time. Mm-hmm. She then moved to California to work for the Center of Independent Living, where she continued a lot of her disability-centered work. She was also really crucial in the development of the legislation that ultimately became the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, commonly referred to as the IDEA. And this is the the law that still protects students with disabilities today. But one really cool part of disability history that I definitely wanted to highlight on as we were giving this background was the 504 sit-in. So, oh, yeah. It's a good yeah. story. Yeah. I always love telling people about this because it's so cool and such like, anyways, we'll get into it. But in 1977, a man named Joseph Califano, and for disabled folks listening, might be like cringing at that name, but <laughs> he's not a loved, beloved no. person in the disability history. So he was the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare at the time, and he refused to sign regulations for Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which was the first U.S federal civil rights protection for folks with disabilities. So because he continued to refuse to sign these regulations, disabled protesters occupied the HEW, which I think people just refer to as Hugh Federal Building. And despite everything Califano did to try to force them out by denying them food, their medication, like very awful stuff. Um, the, the irony of the uh, Secretary of Health Education Literally. and welfare, denying people food and medication. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, yeah, yeah it's he's a, a very not beloved history, historical figure for disabled folks. But yeah, yeah it's, yeah, thank you for pointing out that irony. <laughs> but, but yeah, disabled people are clever. We are scrappy. We are definitely smarter than him. The protesters worked closely with other organizations to get food and the medications and different things they needed delivered that next day. So there was a lot of organization and disability community collaboration that was happening behind the scenes very skillfully and in a way that Califano and other folks just simply were not expecting. And what I also really like about talking about this is also a really important moment in history for cross-movement organizing both with the disability community and the african-american community and this is because brad lomax you might have heard of him he's a really famous historical figure in disability history and is one of the big organizers in disability rights history he was also a part of his community's Black Panther Party and was integral in organizing the Black Panthers to bring the protesters participating in the sit-ins, the food and snacks and everything that they needed nice. to maintain occupation of this building. And the Black Panthers are often acknowledged and credited for a huge impact in the ability for these sit-ins to succeed. And what's cool is that these sit-ins actually lasted almost a month. They were 28 yeah, days long. Yeah, which is the longest sit-in in American history, which is wow. wild because we have such a rich protest and like civil rights movement history where sit-ins were often used to be able to demand civil rights and access. But right. it's always astounding to me that this isn't a more well-known fact that actually like the longest sit-in in American history is for disability rights movement. Yeah, so impressive. Yeah, so because of all of this, Secretary Califano signed the legislation after the sit-in, so it was a success. It was a success, for sure. And as you mentioned, a success in so many other ways, I, like different uh, underserved populations working together. I think it's just, it's such a beautiful thing to sort of go back and think about and, and relive an accomplishment such as this. It's fascinating. Well, speaking of accomplishments, of course, Judy Human had many, uh, just sort of run through them. So, you know, Maddie, you already mentioned the Center for Independent Living. She started the Berkeley Center for Independent Living, which helped to launch that independent living movement and, you know, the whole sort of CIL or Center for Independent Living uh, network, uh, not just in America, but globally. In 1983, she co-founded the World Institute on Disability with the also equally famous Ed Roberts uh, and Joan Leon. Then from 93 to 2001, she was assistant secretary for the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, 
that's under the Department of Education. Uh, that was during the Clinton administration. So that's a huge impact there. Um, after that change of administration, she moved on in 2002. She became the first advisor on disability and development for the World Bank, um, did that through 2006. And then in 2010, President Obama appointed her as the first special advisor for international disability rights at the U.S. Department of State. And she held that position through 2017. And as I'm going through this, I'm just, it's amazing. So many times we've said, oh, the first, the first, the That's first. That's what I was thinking. That's what I was yeah. going to say. Yeah. yeah. Just trailblazing throughout her life. And what, what's really notable like about Judy is that she demanded and was starting to expect these positions to exist that didn't exist before. Like you said, like yeah. first uh, special advisor or first advisor on disability. And right. that is, those are positions that exist today. And those are not even a decade or two decades old, but it's really, really crucial that disability remains in the forefront of our political kind of mindsets that disabled people are thoroughly involved in government and politics to ensure that the things that she experienced growing up don't continue to happen. Yeah, for sure. Well, in 2020, she published her memoir, Being Human, uh, an unrepentant memoir of a disability rights activist. And that was a, a, a major publication uh, in the world of disability rights for sure. So much so that a year later, she wrote a young adult version called Ruling Warrior. And not long after, a studio agreed to uh, a movie adaptation of Being Human. I'm so so that is, I know, I know it's great. <laughs> At last I checked, it's still under development. But uh, Ali Stroker, the first actress on Broadway, that uses a wheelchair. Uh, she is set to play the lead. Yeah, so that's incredible. And Alex Stroker was, herself is like a trailblazer. That's a story um, of its own. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Yeah. So that's great. I can't wait for that. You already mentioned the Crip Camp and Disability Revolution. That, that came out in 2020. Um, and then she also hosted her own podcast, The Human Perspective. And that's a, it was a very successful podcast in the disability space, for sure. And some wonderful guests and great stories on there. Yeah, check that out if you haven't. A valid and common criticism of the disability rights movement is that it was primarily white and like mm -hmm. physically disabled centered, sure. which I, again is valid. And I will say that and this is not negate anything that she's done. It's still very important. Everything that she's done. But I will say that this podcast does make a really big effort to bring other communities, other marginalized communities to the forefront to be able to tell their stories and talk about what disability means in their communities and what living at different intersections looks like, which I think is a continued story that needs to be told. And one that Judy acknowledges very openly all the time that the disability rights movement was whitewashed, even in its retelling of history. So I think she does a really wonderful job of being able to go back and gives other communities like the recognition that they need and deserve and continue to tell those stories. That's a great point. And you're right. She's, she has made that effort and it has been pretty successful at it. There really are like amazing guests on there from so many different backgrounds and walks of life. Definitely. Judy obviously had a great sense of humor. She was on a couple of Comedy Central shows. Her story was told in a uh, a show called Drunk History on Comedy Central and was portrayed by Ali Stroker. That's that's pretty cool. Uh, and then she was a guest on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, uh, I think as part of her book promotion, uh, also in 2020. So just a down-to-earth, funny, personable individual, yet so powerful and so influential. There's this really great quote from Judy in Crip Camp where she says that she wants to see feisty, disabled people change the world. Such a short and sweet quote, but... Yeah, I love that. It's a good choice of words, too. Mm -hmm. Feisty. Yeah. Um. So kind of like how we started, we wanted to give Judy her flowers now that she's become a disabled ancestor and has passed on and really acknowledge and just attribute so much of disability rights advancement to her existence, honestly. And there's plenty, plenty more that we weren't able to include because she truly is such an accomplished and impactful individual. But yeah, un unfortunately, Judy passed on March 4th and they had services 
for her this past Wednesday when we're recording, which is March 8th. And they live streamed it. So a lot of folks um, for distance or safety or access needs or whatever it might be could still join and honor and appreciate her and pay respects to her. Um, and you can watch it if you missed the um, services. They did record it. Well, they recorded the live stream. So you are able to go back and tune in if you'd like. A lot of folks I've seen online in the disability community said it was really beautiful and definitely pay good tribute to her life. I caught the beginning of it, but I got to go back and watch the rest of it. But yeah, I need to watch it too. And you can find it on, uh, there's a link on her website, judithhuman.com. It's on the homepage. There's a link to it. So you can find it really quickly. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we really are truly indebted to Judy and everything that she's done for the disability community and communities and people in and across America and the world, frankly. So we thank you, Judy. We'll definitely miss you and your presence and your wit and your, your advocacy. Um, it definitely was a huge loss for the disability community and we'll definitely miss you. Yeah, for sure. We'll definitely go back and, and watch the live stream and learn more about her, read her memoir. If you haven't before, watch Crip Camp. Yeah, it, it, there's a lot of great information out there for sure. Well, thank you for listening to this episode of the You First podcast. You can be notified when episodes drop uh, by subscribing. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Google, Amazon, anywhere you get podcasts. And for more information and transcripts of each episode, you can visit disabilityrightsflorida.org forward slash podcast. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. The You First podcast is produced by Disability Rights Florida a not-for-profit corporation working to protect and advance the rights of Floridians with disabilities through advocacy and education. If you or a family member has a disability and feel that your rights have been violated in any way, please contact Disability Rights Florida. You can learn more about the services we provide, explore a vast array of resources on a variety of disability-related topics, and complete an online intake on our website at disabilityrightsflorida.org. You can also call us at 1-800-342-0823. Thank you for listening to You First, the Disability Rights Florida podcast.